Morning, Grace Fellowship. Morning. This is the day the Lord has made, and we're going to be glad and rejoice in it. The sun, S-O-N, is shining, and we're praising God. Amen? Amen? Good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Let's pray. Father, your word is the power, the strength, the life source, and it has the ability to change us. We ask now that in the presence of the Holy Spirit, as we bask in the presence of the living Word, that any oppression, any evil influence is bound in Jesus' name. We exercise that authority, and the believers are free to hear what you have for them to hear today. We thank you in advance for what you've already done. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. What's the difference, sermon two? What do you believe? And we're going to just, just briefly touch on the topic of false prophet, false testimony, false teaching. It's a big topic, and I want to bring it to your awareness of how detrimental this actually is. So what do you believe? What do you believe? I know I just said that, and I'm going to say it again. What do you believe? It's not what Pastor Lynn teaches you. It's not what Grandma and Grandpa taught you. It's not what your neighbor teaches you. What do you believe? I asked a professor in seminary this question on this topic. I said, if you got a false prophet standing in the pulpit, he's declaring the false truth, and thousands of people come, and they're being misled. In fact, they're being misled to the point that they're not confessing to believe in the one and only true God. Their soul's condemned to hell. And they're sitting, thinking they're hearing the truth. Who's at fault? That was my question. And he didn't answer me. He said, maybe you need to wrestle with that a little bit and come back next week and we'll talk about it as a really good professor does. They don't just give you the answer. They want you to research it. Researching it and understanding this text we're going to study today, obviously the preacher's at fault. And he's accountable to God. And he's going to be judged. But what about the people? And I tell you today that it is your job to study what I teach you. You can't take for granted what I tell you. It's your job to go to the Word of God and take what you hear and to study it and to say, yes, this aligns with God's Word and this is the truth. That's your responsibility. And many times we, we go to church and we think, oh, what the preacher said is true. Oh, well, I'm accountable to God and believe me, I'm under that judgment of God to tell you the truth. But it's your responsibility then to go home and read it and study it for yourself. Amen? Bible-believing Christian church, that's our job, to go to the Word and to study the Word, research it, study it in Jesus' name. Last week, we learned about the world. The world, the Word, was cosmos. Cosmos, meaning uh, it, there's a system in place. There's an evil system in place that's running and controlling this world. And God's in the world, and he's running and doing his system of the light, and the evil's doing their system of the dark. We learned about that. Now, in that system, there's two religions. Two religions. And the world recognizes, listen to me very carefully here, the world recognizes the evil cosmos system, Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, Islam. It recognizes all of them, and then you go over here in subdivisions, and underneath those systems we get denominations. Presbyterian, Methodist, Lutheran, Baptist. And under those, you get sects. Underneath the Baptist, you got Southern Baptist, you got Northern Baptist, you got Baptist Council, you've got all these Baptist strains. And underneath Lutheranism, you get Missouri Synod Lutheran, you get the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, you get the American Lutheran, the E-Free Lutherans, you get all of these. And listen, the world recognizes all of them. But there's actually only two. There's the inauthentic cosmos worldly system, and there's the authentic 
word of God. There's only two. And that, that's what that whole thing boils down to. There's only two systems at work. And Peter points it out in our text today, 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. The false one, you better be aware of. The false one, you better be in tune to. You better be aware of it. C.S. Lewis puts it this way. He grew up in a time where you still had to go to the apple tree to eat an apple. You couldn't get a canned apple. You still had to go to the peach tree and, and get some fresh peaches. And then came the canning process. And they put the sugary syrup in there that I like to just drink right out of the can. It's like, ah, oh, that tastes good. But there came a time where they started to process it and put it in a can. And instead of going to the tree and getting the real thing, you could just crack open the can and eat it. And he says the problem we've run into is we've gotten used to the canned peaches and we don't remember what the real peach off the tree tastes like. The problem we can have is we're not aware of the false teaching and we get used to the false teaching and we don't remember what the real teaching was like. Let me give you one more example. We've got kids from the age however old enough to run an electronic device until 30 years old Playing football, soccer, hockey, whatever the sport event is on an electronic device. Thinking that's the real deal and they've lost the, the incentive to go outside and to play in the grass and to play in the rain and to play the real thing because they've gotten so in tune to the fake world. That's the problem. Peter puts it this way. He says, but... False prophets also rose among the people. Listen to that. Just as they will be false teachers among you. Just stop there. There's false prophets and false teachers here. I'd like to say no to that answer. I don't know. But according to what Peter says to the congregation, he says they're among you. There will be false teachers with you, in there, with you, who secretly bring in destructive heresies. Even denying master, and if you notice master is capitalized, e even denying Yahweh God himself who taught you all this stuff, who brought them, bringing up themselves bringing upon themselves swift destruction. Many will follow their sensuality. And because of them, the way of truth is blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep couple of things I want to point out there. Secretly bringing in destructive heresies. What, what's a heresy? A heresy is a false teaching. And they secretly bring it in. The first church I served, first sermon I gave there, 14 people. About seven, eight, nine, ten couples. It's a cool little church. Ginger and I fought with the, with the call to that church. But we ended up knowing that's where we had to go. And we move in, and we move into the parsonage, and we start preaching the word. And, and in my crazy, optimistic attitude that I have, like over the top, I'm like, you're going to preach the word, and everybody's going to hear it, and everybody's life is going to be changed, and all the demons will run away, and everybody will be happy, and everybody will get saved. Well, that really didn't happen. Because there was false prophets in the church. And eventually they reared their heads. And eventually they came against us. Because I almost exclusively for three years taught on the power of the presence and the purpose of the Holy Spirit. And God took that and took that church of 20 people to 200. And they said I was teaching heresy. This can't happen under the word of God. So the organization came down on me and they said, what are you doing? Because if you teach about the power of the presence, the purpose of the Holy Spirit, we don't have a job. Okay. 
they listened to over a hundred of my sermons. They put a person in charge to go through and listen to Pastor Dow, listen to what he's preaching, and this is what they came back to me. They said, you have never spoken heresy. You've never spoken a false word about the, the true word of God. And the guy that was on the committee was the one who taught me. He said, because I went into his office one day and I said, I can't do this. And he said, you're right. Go home, go back to farming. Because you can't do it. Oh, that was not what I wanted to hear. But then he says this. He said, don't you ever waver from teaching the truth. Don't you ever go off the biblical truth. Because it's not about you, it's about what the Holy Spirit will do through that word. And it'll change people's lives. He told me that, and now he's sitting there telling me that you can't continue to preach this way because if you do, it's going to cause division. Guess who caused the division? They did. They came in. They caused the division. They caused the conflict from preaching the truth. Peter says it's among the people who secretly bring destructive heresies upon themselves. Number one, instead of causing division in the church today, we are welcoming it. We are. When you look at the kingdom of God, the true church of God across the world, they're welcoming in the world, the cosmos system, into the church so it doesn't cause problems. We don't want to cause division. We don't want to cause conflict. So let's just let the world come in and let, let's the world be part of us. You know what? There's nothing greater, there's nothing worse than teaching a lie about God. Look at Deuteronomy 18.20. The prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak or who speaks in the name of other gods, small g, that prophet shall die. That's the judgment I live under. That's the calling that I have answered. Today we're un-American if we don't accept what others believe. It's a good place to say amen. We're un-American if we don't accept what others believe. We're, we're not church folks if we don't accept what everybody believes today. Instead of causing division, we welcome it in. Division is painful, but it's better to be divided by the truth than be united by error. Another good place to say amen. I have to help you with that sometimes. We're, we're not here to please the masses. We're here to preach the true word of God and let the Holy Spirit do the work. Be careful. You need to realize, you need to realize the presence is among the people. Secondly, you need to recognize their pretense. What do I mean by that? How do you tell? You know, the internet, TV, YouTube, you name it. There is a place you can go and listen to a TV preacher. And actually, if that's how you want to get fed, that's okay. If that's what you need to do on Tuesday morning, doing your coffee time, that's okay. For years, I listened to John Hagee out of Texas. Ginger and I even went to his church. There, there's TV evangelists that are good, and there's some that are horrible. So here, here's how you tell. The false prophet's message is false. Do the truth test. This is one of the main things I want to give you today. Now, I should have maybe made a handout. If you want one, I'll get it to you. Do the truth test. The source test. What's the source of the teaching? If the guy is constantly quoting the newspaper and CNN, uh, what's his source? This better be the source. The source is the word of God. If, if you're listening to a guy on TV, or if you go to a church somewhere, and they never reference Scripture, if they don't bring up the true Word of God, the source is not the Word of God. Number two, the Savior test. Is Jesus, is Jesus the way of salvation? Is he the very Son of God? If, if there's any other source of salvation, it's false. 
And I'll add here that if there's a works mentality, it's false. Because it is by faith alone, through a belief system into Jesus Christ, that you're saved. And if there's anything added to that, it's wrong. You can't add to Jesus. Number three, subject test. Subject test. What is the subject of the teaching? It better be the gospel. It better be the gospel. Born of a virgin, conceived by the Holy Spirit. You just go right through the Apostles' Creed. That better be the subject. And how many times have I told you, Jesus is the subject, period. And he better be the main source of the subject. Number two, salvation test. How are you saved? Good works, man-centered, or God? Luther pounded away at this. He said, it's word alone, faith alone, grace alone. It's nothing you can add to that. Salvation test. Lastly, sanctification test. Is the pastor teaching that as you go, you grow in your faith and you're being sanctified as you go? And is he living that godly life? And is he modeling that to the people? Sanctification test. Godly life. Teaching others to do so also. You've got to be aware of this. And if you want to copy this, I'll give it to you. Some of you might right now be listening to somebody on TV that you have no idea about their background. You might be listening to a podcast. You've never done the research to really know who they are. It's your job to research them and to understand it, to figure it out and find it. When he says in verse 3, and in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. What does that mean? This word exploit is where, it, in the Greek, is plastos, plastios. And it's where we get the word plastic. What, what did we learn really quickly that we could do with plastic? We could mold it. We could mold plastic into almost anything we wanted it to be. And still today, we're molding plastic into things that should never be plastic. Half of our car, I just found out the other day, the hood on my pickup is plastic. It's like, seriously? Moldable. That, that's the word. And in the greed, they will exploit you. They, they will mold you into something that you're not supposed to be molded into at your expense. Molding, shaping you into something other than you. You ever buy a fake leather recliner? You don't have to answer that. You ever buy fake something and it, it two years into it and it's peeling off and it's falling apart it's because it's fake that's this word he says they're going to mold you with false words and then they're going to condemn you they're already condemned he says don't fall into the being molded look for the reality and here's what the devil does he uses your words in his dictionary he will put his explanation on your words oh it sounds really good you better do your research. Is it really good? It's probably not really good. And here's the problem. Sensuality. What's attracting you to it? It looks good. It feels good. It tastes good. It smells good. It's probably not good. <laughs> That's your sensuality. You're spiritual. Once you know the spiritual journey and you are filled with the Holy Spirit, then it can look good because you're functioning out of the spirit, not the sensual. Be careful with that. Do you believe that Jesus Christ came out of the tomb? Do you believe that he was crucified on the cross? Do you believe that because of his perfect blood conceived by the Holy Spirit, God the Father, through the power of the Holy Spirit, was his Father? Yes. If you believe that, then when he died to take away the sin of the world, all of the judgment, all the condemnation that the Father had towards sin went to the back of Christ and took it away. Came out of the tomb in three days. Walked on the earth for 40 days. Ate, slept, ministered. Ascended into heaven and today is seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf. Do you believe that, Jesus? 1980. I went to seminary with this guy. This little town east of here. Ends up in Fergus Falls, Minnesota with me. 
nicest guy, second career. We're two years into a three-year program, but I turned it into a four-year program because I'm a slow learner. So we're two years into it, and we, we had cubicles. That's where we put our books and ate our lunch and drank our coffee, and, and he's sitting there crying. And I said, what, what's the deal? He said, Lynn, when are they going to drop the bomb on us? I said, drop the bomb on us? 1980, 22 years earlier, struggling with his call into the ministry, we shared that part of our life, really in the tension, hallelujah, finally, yes, Lord, I'm going to seminary, and he goes to Wartburg, Iowa. His first class, his Old Testament class, the first day, the professor stands up and says, now, we're all adults here. We know nobody got swallowed by a fish and lived. We know that the earth was not flooded. We're all adults. We know this stuff, right? He could have puked. Well, I'll suffer through the Old Testament class. I'll see what the New Testament class in his second semester is like. He painfully listened to the false teaching for a whole semester that he himself paid for. First day, New Testament 101. Well, come on now, we're all adults here. We know nobody comes back to life. This is a true story. We're talking 43 years ago. Nobody dies on a cross and gets put in a tomb and three days later comes out of it and walks on the earth. For four. We're all adults. We know that that didn't happen. He never went back. Twenty years later, he found the Church of the Lutheran Brethren, where I went to school, who had solid concrete teaching. He's sitting in his cubicle crying. When are they going to drop this ball on us again and tell us this is all false? I said, it ain't going to happen. And he graduated with confidence. And I don't know if he's still serving a church today. I wanted to bring to your attention that this is false teaching 43 years ago. This, this isn't just creeping into the 21st century. The enemy has been with false teaching, especially in our seminaries, especially through the pastors, for over 100 years. You've got to be able to see it. You've got to be able to do the truth test. Look at 2 Timothy 4.3. A time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. I'm a product of that. I have sat and taught and been in front of people who would not endure sound teaching. But have itching ears they will accumulate for themselves, teachers to suit their own passions. Tell us what we want to hear, preacher. Don't tell us what the Word of God says. Tell us what makes us feel good. And they'll turn away from listening to the truth. And they'll wander off in the mist. Who's their God? As for you, Timothy, Paul's writing, as for you, little brother Timothy, be sober-minded, endure the suffering, do the work of evangelists, fulfill your ministry. It goes on a little later. Preach the word. That's not just my calling. It's yours too. Do the work of evangelists. Let the light of God come through you as you're in the community, as we hold back the evil forces that have come against this community and we said no to it. Do your job, Paul is saying. This is part of who you are. And we moved into a society where churches are priding themselves on preaching to the felt needs. Let's make programs, let's do surveys, and let's continue to cater to the felt needs. Felt needs are sensuality. Make me feel good. Look at how many kids we got here. Look at how many adults we got here. And they just keep adding programs to make it bigger and bigger and bigger. But the Word of God is not taught. Quoting a TV evangelist. I don't think anything has been done in the name of Christ that has proved 
more destructive to the human personality and counterproductive and even oftentimes crude and unchristian when the pastor attempts to make people aware of their lost and sinful condition. He ends up my friend. Do you hear that? Don't point out their sin. It's crude. It's unproductive. But he ends it, my friend. That's the part that made my stomach turn. Listen, Jesus Christ is not your friend until you confess to believe in him. You confess to believe in him, bam, you're a born-again believer. You're adopted into the family. He's your friend, and you're his friend. But not until then. And if that hasn't happened, he's your judge. He's the one who will bring the condemnation. He's the one that will come down on you. But when you confess to believe, then he's your friend. Oh, what a friend I have in Jesus. Hallelujah. But not before that. That's what we're up against. Timothy, preach the word. Stand firm. Because all this is going to happen. The next five verses I'm going to read you is what happens. Listen to these words. 2 Timothy 2, starting at verse 4. If God did not spare his angels when they sinned, but he cast them into hell. What's he talking about? The the pride that happened in heaven? And and you want to rebel against me, God, Lucifer? And if, if you want to do this, he doesn't spare judgment but he cast them into hell, committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. And if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, what, what, did, what did he do with Noah? I'm done with this Nephilim coming down and impregnating people and the whole world is corrupt. And he got Noah, the eight righteous people, put into the boat. He said, I'm done with it. And if he didn't spare the world, but preserve Noah, who was a herald of righteousness with seven others, that was his family, and he brought the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Verse 6, if turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued righteous Lot, great distress by the sensual, There's our sensuality, living in the senses. Conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting tormenting his righteous soul over the lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from his trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. Listen, what he's saying is if God did this to those people, what do you think he's going to do to them today? Let me make something very clear. When you study Sodom and Gomorrah, America is living in a worse condition today than what Sodom and Gomorrah was. And what did he do to it? We have to understand that if he didn't withhold judgment and he placed judgment and he did these things, he flooded the old earth. He said, I'm done with this. He's not going to spare it for those who are ungodly, false teaching, false witness today. And you're saying, jeepers, Pastor Lynn. Well, guess what? The gospel's coming. But I want to make it clear that the false prophet, the false teaching, the ungodly is here today. It's reigning. It's ruling. It's part of the cosmos system. And we need to be aware. Because he didn't spare anything then, he's not going to spare anything now. But here's the cool part, is that all of the anger, all of the frustration, all of the wrath that God had towards this ungodly cosmos system, all of the fallen angels, all of that system, God says, I'm angry at it. And God does get angry. But guess what he did with that anger? He put it all onto the back of Christ. All of it went to Jesus. Every whip from the Romans, all of that frustration, every nail that was drove into his hands, the crown of thorns, all of that went to Christ's 
back. He says, you want to see my righteous judgment be carried out? Look at the cross. Look at the cross. That's where it went. My Jesus took it. My Jesus received it. And he took it. That's the beauty, folks. That's the blessing of of what we're talking about today. But if your faith and your confession is not into Jesus, that's what you receive. Our God is an all-consuming, righteous. And how in the world can he look at you and say, hey, you're good to go? It's because you confess to believe and he is right standing in his righteousness and he can be just in his justice because of what I just explained to you. And when you confess to believe, he says, your salvation is dependent on Jesus the Christ. He took your sin away and now you're free. Amen? Amen. Another good place to say, amen, hallelujah. Jesus did that. We can be aware of these things, but we've got to be aware of how great Jesus Christ is and what he actually accomplished for us and what he did for us. Romans 8, 31 through 39, it's only eight verses. I would encourage you to go home and memorize it. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? When you go through your life and you're having a tough day, say that. If God is for me, who can be against me? Get behind me, Satan. You loser, go to hell. You've got to get used to saying that because if he's for me, who can be against me? He who, here it is again, he who did not spare his son but gave him up for us, what I just explained to you, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Psalm 23, he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Folks, you and I, we confess to believe we're sitting at the table with Jesus. And we're eating dinner. We're, we're, we're having a chill time with Jesus. Having a soda and roast beef and prime rib. Whatever your favorite food is. You're having it with Jesus. And all the evil world has to sit there and watch it. He prepares a table for you and me. In the presence of my enemies. He gives all things. Who shall bring any charge against God elect? Listen, if you're living a life today and you get up in the morning and the devil says, you're condemned today, you loser. Did you really confess to believe in Jesus? That's what the devil does. Who can do that? Nobody. Who shall bring against the charge against us? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? He can't, you can't be condemned. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ. Hallelujah. What can separate you from the love of Christ? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword. As it is written, he quotes Isaiah, for you seek for your sake, we we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Not anymore. 37, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Get up in the morning and say, I am a conqueror in Jesus' name. The blood of Jesus has redeemed me. I have received my redemption. The enemy's behind me. If who's for me, who can be against me? March out your door and shout it in the middle of your street. And the neighbors will say, they're going to that grace fellowship. (laughs) And you're going to say, hallelujah. Hallelujah. (laughs) hear that kid more than conquerors through him who loved us for I am sure listen to this next list neither death we don't have death to fear nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation what is anything else in all of creation the whole demonic world all of it will be able to separate us from the love of God in my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You can't be separated from it. Oh, he's going to try. But when you're standing in the middle of the street, he's not going to like it. 
But that's when you say, get behind me, Satan. Greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. I'm a lover of Jesus. Jesus loves me and I'm saved. So listen up, world. That's who I am. And if you don't like it, go home and read your Bible. And figure it out. Because I have nothing to fear. Unless your sin is covered by the blood of Jesus, sin, old nature from Adam, you will not be spared. You will not. And when I say that, I mean when you take your last breath here and it's your first breath there, God the Father looks to Jesus the Son and says, Does this one know you? That's what you'll hear. And Jesus will say, Yes, this one knows you. And the Father will say, Hallelujah. God the Father says to the Son, does this one know you? And Jesus says, no. You will be forever separated from the love of God. He will not spare that, and he cannot change. But I just shared with you in Romans chapter 8, and take that and rest assured. That when you confess to believe in Jesus, when you hear that chain of command, when you take your last breath, he's going to say, welcome home, thy good and faithful servant. Why do we need to know about false prophets? So that we can stand firm in the word of God. And we can go forth with the power, the authority, the might. Folks, if you haven't looked around lately, this world's going sideways quickly. It's changing. And he's called us, the kingdom of God, the body of believers, to be that witness. Evangelist Timothy, go and preach the word. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today with joy of the Lord in our hearts. Jesus, we, we are in awe of who you are and what you have done. So many times uh, the world will say, well, the Roman soldiers took Jesus' life. Judas betrayed him and turned him in. The nailing him to the cross is what did him in. All the above is true, but the reality is it was the judgment of the Father that fell on his back. Someone had to pay the price for the sin that happened in the garden, and our Jesus did it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for doing it for us. We will never know the depth of what we should have deserved. Jesus, we pray in the strong name of, of you that through the power of the Holy Spirit, we don't get comfortable living under the curse. We don't get comfortable in our sensuality, but we get comfortable in our redemption, in our witnessing of how great you are. What a friend we have in Jesus. And if there's anybody here today that has never said, Jesus, I need you, I repent of my sin, I want to turn from my old sinful nature, and I want what you have. Do that right now. And simply cry out and say, I want you, Jesus. If there's anybody watching this, if that's never happened in your life, and the Holy Spirit is moving in you right now, and you're, you're feeling the weight of it, just cry out and say, Jesus, I want you. I'm repenting of my old nature and I want to embrace the grace. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that nothing can come against us. And Father, I pray that grace is empowered, grace is, is moved through their redemption. And as we go out into the world, because the trumpet can blow any time, use us, Father, use this body, use this fellowship to preach the word. 
and to be strong and to say thank you Jesus I thank you for what you're doing here in the good and strong name we pray the prayer he taught us our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever Amen. Let's stand for the
I guess I need to say he's the best looking guy in the congregation. A <laughs> um, couple of things to clarify real quick. Um, young couples marriage class will start, the day has been changed, and there's been some confusion on that, but it'll start next week. So we decided to wait till after the Super Bowl, so that'll start on the 18th. Um, what do I mean by young couples? If you still have kids in high school or college, you're welcome to the class. The reason we separated the older group from the younger group is because discussion is a lot different when you have kids at home than it is when you are <clears throat> empty nesters. So that's why we separated that. Um, also, uh, I want to bring to your attention Miranda and Leanne. Um, they'll be organizing and planning our youth and our youth events um, during this time of transition. And we're really super thankful that they stepped up right away and they approached Pastor Lynn <clears throat> and they approached the elders and just had a phenomenal um, plan for going forward with activities and some changes and some stuff. So um, they are going to be organizing and doing that. So if you start getting emails and phone calls from them when it's youth related, uh, that's why. <clears throat> so thank you guys. Um, so um, so the next thing I want you to do is if you brought your cell phone, uh, get your cell phones out because we have really exciting news. Um, Courtney, Courtney SB has designed our new website. It is up and going and launched. So if you go to Grace Fellowship of Hartley.com, um, you will find uh, a totally new designed website that's going to be much more user friendly. Um, and Courtney will also, from here on out, maintain our website and our app. So all you young couples will really appreciate we have an app. So what I'm going to tell you to do here is, if you go to your web, go to the website, and then scroll down to the media options. That isn't it. and you see download the Grace app. So click on download the app and then choose the proper app store according to the phone that you have. It'll give you options. Um, then click on install. So once installed, you can open the app to see the main page. I don't know if we have the main page up there or not. And then click on the person icon, it'll be on the top right of the app. And there you can set up your account so you can log in because we are going to be doing like push notifications and things like that through there. So if there's an event or it snows and Ignite is changed, um, you'll get a, those of you with kids in Ignite and 412, you'll get an automatic notification. So that is going to be really, really nice. I know you young guys are used to all that. But just finally joining you, so that's exciting for Grace. Um, also on our website and in our app, we'll have our giving tab. So again, if you're used to giving through websites, apps, and you just like clicking buttons and getting it done, um, you can now do that through our website and our app. So we're kind of excited about all these changes. Um, Grace definitely isn't missing a beat here as we're going forward. And we're excited about the changes and everything that's coming. So I guess that's all I got. And now you can go home. So. <laughs> Thank you. I guess the only thing I want to say to that is, is thank you, Ginger. And this is something that is really a step forward for us. It's been done very professionally. It's amazing. And 
I'm 63 and I use apps, and I know all the younger group does, and that giving part of this is huge. Notifications, communication, all of the above that's coming with this is really going to be a blessing. So, all right? Go in peace and serve the Lord.